almost forget about it. And uh, we have been running the high school counselor learning series since the pandemic. Uh, so this is a series provided every month and we use a variety of different topics to help high school counselor to get important knowledge skills about themselves and also something they can pass on to their student. And we are actually planning continue running the session too. Hopefully one day this will be in-person workshop we are able to provide on Kent State campus. And uh, today we, it's our honor to invite Kritika, a great friend and also a great colleague who's at Kent State also a newly advanced mom <laughs> since eight months ago. <laughs> And uh, she will be bringing a session about the networking. It's easier than you think. And without further ado, let me go ahead uh, making her a co-host so she can go ahead starting presenting about the session today. Thank you, Color. Let me just make sure I can share my screen. Uh, yes, I can. Excellent. Let me know when you can see my slides. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, excellent. So thanks again for having me here today. So my name, as Color mentioned, is Kritika Gro, and I'm a senior career advisor here at Kent State University. I work for a department called Career Exploration and Development. And as the name implies, my department is here to serve all students before they even get to campus and long after they have left campus with their career needs. So whether it's helping them pick a major, helping them figure out what to do with their careers, if they're unsure, uncertain about what direction they wanna go in, or for those who know what they wanna do, we help them get the experiences that they need to really thrive in those careers and succeed, whether it's finding an internship, finding a full-time job, finding a co-op opportunity, writing a resume, learning how to interview. There are so many different steps to learning how to be successful in one's career. And that's what our department's here to help them with. And another piece of a, a huge piece of finding career success, specifically in the United States, but also in so many other countries globally, is that art of networking. Figuring out who to connect with, how to connect with them, and why these connections will be useful. So that's what we're gonna focus on today so that you as counselors can first of all, take this information if it's useful to you yourselves in your own lives, and also so that you can then be that vehicle that you know, who can share this information with your students and help them prepare for a career overseas where they can you know, come in and even if they don't know a single person, they have the tools necessary to get to know people, to make connections from scratch, and not feel like they're far behind their uh, American colleagues or whatever country they end up traveling to. So first of all, I wanna start with some job search statistics. 80% of jobs in the United States are not advertised. That's a huge percentage. So ultimately in this country, it does come down to who do you know? Because that's a lot of where jobs come from. And that can immediately sound like a disadvantage to our international students, right? Because they might not know as many people as their domestic friends and peers. Um, but again, it shouldn't be a disadvantage if you know how to navigate networking and what to do, what steps to take. And before you know it, students can make those contacts and you know, feel at an equal playing field with their American colleagues. More than half of candidates are eliminated from the online job search by applicant tracking systems. So a lot of larger companies, when you think about you know, the Google, the Amazon, like the big companies, they don't go through every single resume that is submitted just because they get hundreds and hundreds of resumes every single day. They just don't have that kind of capacity to review all of those resumes. So what they do is they use software that scans resumes, looks for keywords, uh, words that they are looking for in a candidate. And then depending on these keywords, Either the resume is sorted into a pile of qualified candidates or a pile of dismissed candidates. So now the thing is, when software is reviewing these resumes, sometimes even the best candidates could potentially be disqualified just if they don't have their resumes uh, formatted exactly the way the software would require it to be formatted. And if that is the case, again, networking can really help because you can have a human on the inside, you know, working for the company, say, you know what, there was this one candidate who had applied. 
I don't see their name on your list of selected candidates to interview, please go back and review you know, all your applications. You obviously don't have to go through the hundreds and hundreds of resumes, but look for this one resume by this one person. I know them, and I think you should interview that. So again, having that person on the inside, put in a good word, can go miles. That can really, really help. And that's, again, where that power of networking can really help someone who would have otherwise just been dismissed by some, you know, robot, essentially. And then only about five applicants actually earn an interview from hundreds of applications. So once again, to be part of that top five, it helps if you have someone putting in a good word for you or someone who already knows you. Maybe the hiring manager knows you because you reached out to them through LinkedIn or you met with them in person at a career fair or you know, in this world of COVID where in-person isn't as useful, I mean, isn't just happening anymore, uh, hopefully soon, but just not yet in this current climate, were you able to connect with these people in a different way? So again, that's what we're gonna talk about today. Like there are so many different ways to network. We'll talk about what are those strategies. And finally, referrals account for about a third of all external hires. So once again, these statistics all just go to show why networking, while tedious, is so important a step to take in the job search process. Some more statistics here. According to a job bite survey, four in 10 job seekers have found their favorite or best job through personal connections. So again, even if one isn't looking for the first job or just any job, even if you're very happy and content where you're currently at in your career, there's always that opportunity to find the favorite or best job of your career. And that can happen for any of us, right? I mean, many of you counselors who are here today might be very content, but are you in your favorite possible job? Maybe you are, and if you are, that's wonderful. If you're not, just remember networking can be that tool that can help you get that favorite job for you or to help your students figure out what that is. And I shared this already, 80% of all jobs in the United States are secured through networking. There, of course, are other ways to connect with employers to find jobs, you know, whether it's through an agency, whether it's through those posted advertised jobs that do make up 20% of jobs. And even though 20% doesn't sound like a very large number, it actually accounts for millions and millions of job postings that are out there. So one could obviously find a job just by going on a job board and submitting their resume. That does happen. But having connections and networking can shorten your job search. It can help you get that interview even after you've submitted your resume. So there are so many benefits beyond just finding a job. And then the old saying is, it's not what you know, but who you know. So many of us have grown up hearing this, right? That it's not what you know, it's who you know. But think of networking as taking it even one step further. It's not just who you know, but who you get to know. Because when you think about the saying who you know, it's very limiting. It means that we've been dealt cards at the time of birth and who we know is who we know and we can't change our circumstances. But that's not true. Networking is very <laughs> intentional a process and we can get to know people who we don't know. And we can expand our social network thereby expanding our social capital. So a new perspective, first of all, Resistance is completely normal. I've heard from students over and over and over again that they don't want to network because it feels disingenuous to them. It doesn't feel sincere. It feels like they're connecting with people just because they need something, they want something. And while that is true to a certain extent, networking is so much more. It doesn't just have to be the selfish gesture. You can also share so much with someone else when you connect with them. You too have so much to offer. It's not just about taking, it's about giving as well. So just remember, resistance is normal. Even if you don't want to do it, just remember the benefits and try it. See if it serves you. And then networking is not just for those who have a preference for extroversion. Networking can be for anyone, the shyest of the people, the quietest of the people. There are strategies you can use no matter what type of person you are, no matter what your personality is like. And it can be planned, of course, but it can also happen when you don't expect it. And that's why you should be prepared to network no matter where you are. This one time I was on an airplane and when I'm on an airplane and I fly a lot, of course, not during COVID, but previously I was always this jet setter traveling everywhere. My husband and I were always looking at like what country can we, can we go to next and visit next, check off our list. Um, and the thing is, when I'm on airplanes, that's my time. 
I like to just shut off and just sit there with my thoughts. And I like to enjoy that little quiet space while being amongst hundreds of strangers, right? And I don't like to talk to people always. But this one time, there was someone sitting next to me and he clearly wanted to talk. I had headphones in, but he was gesturing that he wanted to talk. And in my head, I was just like, oh, can't you tell I've got headphones in? Shouldn't that indicate that I don't want to talk to you right now? But of course, I did the polite thing and I was courteous. I took off my headphones. I said hello. And he started chatting and he was the most wonderful gentleman. And it ended up, he ended up being the head of marketing for the Daily Mail in London. And this was at a time when I myself was a journalist. And had I not taken that time to actually listen to what this man had to say, I would have never known who he was or what he brought to the table. And of course, like I said, this is back in the time when I myself was a journalist. I'm not a journalist anymore. I'm a career advisor, but I work with international students and I work with students who want to go into the career communities, the industries of communications, entertainment, and media. So that one, one connection that I made at the Daily Mail wasn't to serve me. The whole purpose of connecting with that person at that stage of my life was so it could help my students down the road. So I could connect students with him down the road. So again, you never know that power of networking and when it's going to happen and who you're going to meet and how they're going to be useful to you and how you can be useful to them. And networking is not about selling yourself always. It's about learning. The whole purpose of networking is to get more information. And finally, think of it as just purposeful communication. That is what networking is. It is intentional communication with someone else who is a professional and you are a professional and you're developing a professional working relationship. So I want each of you now to think about what is your communication style because knowing how you communicate can really help you effectively communicate and it can also help you communicate better with your students and anyone else that you're looking to communicate with. So first of all, in the chat, I want you to add uh, just really quickly, do you know if you're someone who has more of a preference for extroversion or introversion? And I'll share just very briefly what that means. Extroversion is the more you talk to people, the more fulfilled you feel. Like think of your life as a balloon. The more communication you do with people during a day, does your balloon fill with air with each communication or does it deflate the more you communicate? Those who have a preference for extroversion draw energy from the external world. That's why the word is extroversion. You draw it from outside, from other people. And those who are introverted or have a preference for introversion, draw that energy internally. Doesn't mean that they don't like to talk to people, but maybe they draw that energy internally and they like to choose how they communicate so that too much communication with people doesn't deflate them and make them feel drained. So let me take a look at the chat here. So I see one extra version. So go ahead and put in the chat again where you think you are. Do you love connecting with lots and lots of people daily? Or are you more like, you know, more internal and you like to have your share of communication, but within reason? So I see another introverted from Rana, an extroversion from Arian. Very good, very good. So if you happen to be like Rana, you know, you've got that you know, preference for introversion, don't be discouraged to start networking or to help your students networking. So I want each of you once again to just think for a moment and think about what is your preferred style or preferred format for, for communicating with people? Do you like to talk to people over the phone, in person, but in a group setting, online, through email, or in person, one-on-one? -on -one? Once again, go ahead and put that in the chat just so I can see where you're each at and what is your preferred way of communicating. I'll share with you, I have a preference for extroversion, but I love to communicate through email because I can gather my thoughts and put something in writing that I know by the time I hit send that I'm saying exactly what I really want to say and I'm thoughtful about it. The one thing about people who are extroverted, you might think and speak at the same time. So you're not always taking that step to be thoughtful because you're like thinking and speaking so quickly. So at the same time, simultaneously. So with email, it gives me that ability to just stop my brain for a second, think about what I wanna write, write it, double check it, 
make sure there are no grammatical mistakes and then hit send and I'm happy with my response. So let, go ahead and put in the chat, what is your preferred way of communicating? So Rana is saying in-person one or one-on-one -on -one or text message. I learned to make phone calls and present in from an audience. Yeah, job requirements. So it doesn't mean we can't do these other things. We have to do them, right? We have to talk on the phone. We have to be in-person group, online email. We do all of these and we can be skillful at them all. But we might have a preference. One style is our preferred style than others. So thank you, Rana. Anyone else want to share what is your preferred style of networking in the chat? Email, more detailed and organized, but face-to-face -face in groups are the most enjoyable. Yes, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's the most enjoyable. Great. Thank you for sharing. So let's talk about in-person networking. Again, hopefully our worlds will stabilize at some point and we'll be able to go out and not just see our close family and friends, but be able to see strangers again. And, you know, in countries where you do handshakes, you won't be worried about touching someone's hand again, or in countries where you hug, you won't be worried about hugging again. Hopefully we're getting there soon, hopefully. But when we get to that stage, whether it's for you or your student that you're working with, there are certain suggestions that I have for in-person networking. Use an Excel sheet or any other format to track your connections whether it's columns in a Word document or some sort of online tool, track your connections because there will come a day when you forget their name, you forget their title, you forget what company they worked for, you forget where you met them. Write it all down. Even if you meet someone, like today you've met me. Tomorrow you might still remember my name. A year later, you might just be like, ah, oh, there was this one Indian at Kent State, no idea what her title was, no idea where she worked you'll forget me. And that's normal, right? So write down every connection of yours so that when you need it, you can go back and refer very quickly to who did you meet with? When did you meet with them? What did you talk about? What is their title? What industry are they in? What is their email address? What is their LinkedIn URL? So that you can go back and track it. And then talk to obvious people to expand your social network. Start with who you already know, because that's our immediate network. That is that old saying, you know, it's not who you know, it, it's not what you know, it's who you know. So start with who you know, because if you start making a list of every person in your immediate life, you realize that you do know a lot of people. Who are your parents? Who are your guardians? Who are your other family members? Who are siblings? Who are friends, neighbors that you grew up with? Teachers that taught you at one point, college professors, people you worked with, start to make a list even the more like non-obvious ones, who's your doctor, your dentist, the person who cuts your hair, every person that you know can know someone in their circle who would be the perfect person to help you find your dream job, your favorite job, or your dream job, a favorite job for your students. So again, start to think about who do I know? And then of course, be intentional. Attend job fairs, other industry-specific networking events, conferences, you can meet amazing person, you know, people through conferences. Join chapters of conference committees if you can, if your time allows it, get involved professionally. How many of you, again, through chat, are involved in some kind of professional association? So I'll share about myself. I am the vice chair of social engagement of the Com Commission for Career Services at ACPA, which is the American College Personnel Association. So my job is to constantly come up with social events for the Commission for Career Services. And that has allowed me to meet amazing people, not just nationally, but also internationally. I just met people from the Bahamas the other day and it was amazing. Of course, when I say met, I mean virtually, but it's still a connection. So in the chat again, go ahead and tell me if you are involved in any way with the professional association. And that's okay if you're not. It's just another suggestion for something you could do or something you could suggest that your students do to get involved and to get to know more people who are in the same kind of industry as you. So Rana is saying, I'm a member of IACAC. Excellent, excellent. All right. And again, recommend to your students that professional associations have student chapters as well. So they can take a look at student chapters and see if it's something that they would like to get involved in. So that way, before they even graduate, 
they have some connections. In-person networking continued. Obviously get involved and networking can be done outside of your personal group, uh, outside of professional groups as well. It can be in personal groups, you know, groups related to your hobbies, interests, social groups, religious institutions, et cetera. Again, you never know where you're gonna meet people who will be, you know, who you can have a mutually beneficial relationship with. And always be aware of how you behave just because you don't know who might be the next person referring you, recommending you for a job, right? So again, just something to keep in mind, be authentic, but at the same time, just be courteous, be polite, just watch your body language. Because again, you don't know what these people are going to bring to the table down the road. And prepare your one minute elevator pitch, which is if you were in an elevator and you stopped at a floor and the person who's the owner of this one company that you want to get involved with or one of your students want to get involved with, um, you know, what would you say to this person when they step into the elevator? And again, you have very limited time because elevator rides are quick, right? You're not going to the top of the Empire State Building. You're just going to the fourth floor or whatever it might be. So it's a quick communication. What would you say about yourself to introduce yourself to someone? You in a nutshell, 60 seconds, no more. What would you say about yourself? So again, think about the situation, elevator pitch. And if you met the right person, how would you introduce the professional you? And finally, follow up. After you've met someone, don't be worried to take that relationship to the next level. Connect with them on LinkedIn. Send them an email saying it was nice to meet you. Don't worry about whether you're disturbing them. Again, if you're connecting with them virtually or through email, they can respond to you when they have the time. You're not disturbing them. It's not the same as barging into someone's office, right? In person and saying, hello, I'm here to talk to you. I don't care about your time right now and whether you're in the middle of something. If you send an email, it's very different. So again, remember following up to an in-person event is not happening in person. So you're not disturbing them. Just think about how every contact you make can bring you closer to the next job or can help you help your student get to the next step in their careers. And then I want you to put in the chat very quickly, thinking about that elevator pitch again. If you were the employer and someone walked into the elevator with you and decided to introduce themselves, would you remember this person? Hey, how's it going? Can you tell me a little about your company? I really need to find a job as soon as possible. Oh, hold on, I just got a text. Are you guys hiring business majors? Tell me in the chat, would you remember this person after you step off the elevator and two months down the road? So just go ahead and tell me yes or no. Probably not. Probably not. And the sad thing is you might remember them, but you remember them for the wrong reasons. That they were very distracted. They checked a text message while trying to communicate with you, which is just rude. So you probably wouldn't remember them, or if you did, it wouldn't be for the best reasons. What about this person? Hi, Ms. Smith. Um, how are you today? I'm a motivated team player, skilled in problem resolution, uh, highly interested in any opening in your company. Can I set up an interview time with you? What about this person? Would you remember them? Let's say six months later. Or if you were at a fair, if you were an employer at a career fair and you met 500 students on a given day, would you remember this student? Again, share in the chat with me, yes or no. Too much like a mouse, so also no, probably not. Yeah, I mean, this the student isn't doing anything terribly wrong, but they're just unremarkable, right? Like you just wouldn't remember them if you met like hundreds of students. If you only met the student, maybe you'd remember that, maybe. But a maybe might not be strong enough. Good presentation, but not good elevator pitch. Exactly, exactly. So the student has work to do. Oops, I went in the wrong direction. Now, what about this person? Hi, Ms. Smith. It's very nice to meet you. My name is Kerry Jones, and I'm a senior communication studies student at Kent State University, and I have been following your company over the past couple of months. I am very excited about the new advocacy and social justice newsletter that was posted on your website that has recently become one of my areas of interest and passion. I would love for an opportunity to meet with you and to get advice on how to break into this field. When is a convenient time for you? 
What about this student? Would you remember this student? Most definitely, yes. Yes. Yeah, especially when you have, you know, in comparison, someone who's like a mouse, as you said, or someone who was just straight up rude. This student is so polished. They show research into, into your organization. They're not just stopping by and saying, hey, what does your company do? No, they're saying, I know what you do. I've engaged with your company. And I'm here intentionally to set up a time to learn more. They're not saying, hey, would you give me an internship? They're saying, I want advice. Advice is free to give. So you see, networking is about like intentional, purposeful communication. This here elevator pitch here is purposeful. So that's how you want to encourage your students to connect. And if you are also in a stage of your career where you want to connect, whether it's for you or to build your network so you can further connect your students, this is a good way to go about it. And then getting to online networking. Recent surveys confirm that the majority of employers are extremely likely to look at social networking sites, to screen candidates. And many will reconsider a candidate based on what they viewed in a social profile. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter are the top three sites that candidates are using to find opportunities. And now remember, like again, right now we have no option but to only do everything online. But once the world is safe, once again, online networking should supplement your in-person networking and shouldn't completely replace it because ultimately, Studies show, research shows that the most impactful way of networking is when you meet a person in person. A person in person. That was a little tricky to say, but you wanna start with online networking because it's an easy way to connect with someone, but you don't wanna end it there. You ultimately want to meet people if you can. Of course, sometimes it doesn't, uh, you know, your circumstances won't allow it. If your student is in Morocco and you're trying to connect with a Kent State student in the United States, in person might not be possible, and that's okay. But where possible, try to do in person and supplement with online. So join Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn pages for your university, high school, you know, any alma mater of yours, professional societies, associations, industry specific listservs that you can. And then share information on these platforms so that people will constantly engage with you, the professional, as well. And they are constantly reminded of your presence and what you bring to your industry. And locate for students who are interested in joining Kent State, I would say even before they submit their applications, look up Kent State alumni from your countries, connect with them, ask them about their experience at Kent State. If they wanna to talk to me, I am a Kent State alumna as well, and now I work here, I'd be happy to share information about how I moved to Kent State in 2005. And in 2021, I'm still here. There's a reason for that because Kent State has been home away from home. I shared with you previously, I'm from Kolkata, India. Home is thousands of miles away. And for me, when people ask me, where is home? While I might still say I was born and raised in India, home for me now is Kent, because I've been here just as long as I was in India. So have your students connect with Kent State alumni. If they wanna to go to a different university, that's okay. Have them connect with alumni from that institution. They should talk to people before they just pack their bags and travel overseas with no connection in that university. And I'll show you a really easy way to connect. So let me pull up. I have my LinkedIn pulled up. I want to show you how can people find Kent State alumni very quickly. Um, let me know if you can see my LinkedIn. Can you just nod your head or give me a thumbs up? I want to make sure that I'm sharing the right screen. Are you seeing my LinkedIn right now? Yes, okay, I see color nodding. All right, so if your students don't have LinkedIn profiles, I would encourage them to get a LinkedIn profile, to sign up. LinkedIn is available in a majority of countries today. So, you know, check with your country regulations, make sure it's available, and if it is, get a profile. And then up here in the search bar, type in Kent State University, and you'll see this first option, company, higher education with the official logo, internet's being a little bit slow so please bear with me and then once it loads you'll see there's a button here for alumni click on that and you will immediately see that there are hundreds and hundreds of alumni that one can connect with 162,000 plus alumni and it's 
filtered. You can filter them by where they live, where they work, what they do, what they studied, what they're skilled at, and whether you have any mutual connections with them. You can also use the search bar up here and further narrow it down. If your student is interested in, let's say, careers at Google, and they want to know, are any Kent State students working at Google? Just type that in. And it will filter it for you. And you'll see there are 4,700 Kent State alumni who work at Google. And then if you scroll down, you'll see exactly who these people are. And guess what? The very first one is a recruiter. Great person to connect with, to network with, if you someday want an internship, a co-op, a part-time job, or a full-time job at Google, right? So great, great tool. Please encourage your students to connect with people before they make a decision about where they want to study. So I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint right now. Once again, by a nod or a thumbs up, let me know if you're seeing my PowerPoint. Are you seeing my PowerPoint? Uh, yes, okay, excellent. All right, so sample script for networking. What do you say once you've connected with that recruiter at Google, right? You wanna make sure that, again, your communication is very purposeful. Um, just seeing that's something in the chat as well, okay. Dear Ms. Jones, I'm a junior at Kent State, and of course, customize the language. This is just one example of what to say. Your students might not be juniors at Kent State, but that's okay, they can fill in the blanks. I'm a junior at Kent State, majoring in psychology, and was given your name by Professor Smith as someone who could provide me with great career guidance. I've been considering a career in research, and I'm intrigued by your studies, study results. I've read many of your articles in psychology today and find your field of research fascinating. I would appreciate the opportunity to speak with you to learn more about how you entered the field of research, as well as gain some insight into the profession. Additionally, I'm considering an internship this summer. and would be grateful for any advice and our leads that you could provide. I'm hopeful that you might have half an hour to speak with me. Obviously, the in-person right now isn't going to work or on the phone about your career and background. And that's the kind of message you can send. I also want to share a sample LinkedIn message that a student of mine sent to me recently. I'll give you a little background. This is an international student, and he has given me full permission to show, show his LinkedIn message to you today with his name and everything. This was a student who connected with me about two and a half months ago at this point. He was just devastated. He was like, I've applied for about 80 internships for the summer. I've been applying since October of last year. Nobody even wants to give me a chance. I just get rejection email after rejection email. Is it because I'm an international student? Is it because my first name is one that they cannot pronounce? Should I change my name? Like think about what a dark place the student was in to consider changing their names, a name that their parents probably spent weeks and months lovingly picking out for them. How sad is that, right? For someone to think my international status is costing me this job. It wasn't. It was just that they were submitting through an online portal and nobody was probably paying attention to it. I worked with the student week after week after week and they started connecting with recruiters on LinkedIn. I'm gonna share one email with you. I'm gonna pull that over to this page. Um, hopefully you can see my email right now. This student, this is a copy pasted message. Um, they had sent this through LinkedIn, but he forwarded it to me through email. He reached out to a recruiter. Actually, he reached out to 18 recruiters at a company called NetJets. 18, 17 of them ignored him. One responded back and said, let's, let's have, a, have a quick chat. Can you talk today? The student threw on a suit, got in front of his computer, had a conversation with this recruiter. This recruiter passed on Shore's um, resume to the hiring manager for the particular internship that was available. After many rounds of interviewing, he is currently in Columbus and started his internship last week and met with the CEO yesterday. This student who thought there was no chance for an international student to get an internship actually ended up with four different offers from four different companies. NetJets is the one that he really wanted and he picked it and he is living his dream right now. So a message like the one that you're seeing in the screen helped him helped him get noticed. And again, 17 people ignored him. The 18th person is all he needed. He needed one. One is all it takes. 
So please encourage your students to keep trying, be persistent, be dedicated, and the universe will respond. So hopefully you were able to take a look at that email. I'm not reading it out for the sake of time. We talked about the alumni tool on LinkedIn, so I'm gonna skip this slide. And then just a recap about what networking allows you to do. It allows you to hit, uh, tap into that hidden job market, that side door approach because only 20% of jobs are advertised. So how do you learn about these 80% of jobs? You learn about them by connecting with individuals, not through you know, just online portals. It allows you to have an edge on the competition due to the relationship you have established. Again, to go back to Shore, the student whose email I just shared, this is an undergraduate junior student in aviation, undergraduate. This student got one of the free LinkedIn one month premium packages that allows you to look at job insights. When you apply for a job, it allows you to compare yourself with other candidates. It said, I remember him telling me that about 95% of the candidates who had applied for that same internship had master's degrees. Again, this was an undergraduate junior. He got the internship, not those master's students because he had an edge on the competition because he had now formed a personal relationship with this company through networking. It allows one to be informed, to learn more, to gain visibility for future opportunities. Even if you don't get the job at that moment, something can work out in the future and a recruiter might say, you know what? I remember this one student. He was a junior at the time and maybe too young for us, but right now he might be a senior. It's been a year after he applied. Let me reach out and see if he's interested. That happens a lot. It allows you to gain recommendations and referrals. And at the end of the day, strong networking equals a shorter job search. Who doesn't want a short job search, right? So that's the power of networking. And I wanna end by saying, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go with others. So these are contact information for Color and Me because we're here to also encourage you to network with us, connect with us. We want to keep in touch with you, whether your students come to Kent or not. You are someone we have met across the globe. So we are now friends, we are connections. So here's my email address, here's my LinkedIn. Please feel free to connect with me, feel free to collect, connect with Color, find her on LinkedIn as well. And I'll leave this slide up for you. And at this stage, I wanna ask if you have any questions for me or for Color. And feel free to unmute yourself because I'm not looking at my Zoom screen. I'm still looking at my slide. So I won't be able to see you. Just unmute and ask me your questions. I also wanted to add that for international students, uh, I mean, there, of course, it's a uh, in general, the uh, looking for a job is not an easy process. And I think international students do have to work a little bit harder on networking in order to find the positions they're interested in. Um, bye, Rita. And Hi, <laughs> thanks for coming. Yeah, as a matter of fact, if I, you know, from talking to Critica before, I think both of our jobs we landed at Kent State was through networking. Yes. So it's not really a regular application process. It's actually through the connections, through the professors, through the department chairs talking about what we want to do for university. And that's yeah. something. And, and not just what Color shared, not just did we get our positions through networking. When you think about it, Color and I are both international people, right? I'm from India, Color's from China. Um, we also got, I, and Color, I don't want to speak for you, but I got a visa through Kent State. And that's huge because for international candidates, a lot of times companies want to hire them, but they might not want to sponsor them if they don't know them enough, if they don't know if they want to invest the time, the patience required to go through immigration, the money. So if they know you and they've already formed this connection and they know what you bring to the table, they're willing to go that extra step as yeah. my employer was willing to do for me. Mm -hmm. I think H1B can be on its own separate presentation for just like that whole oh, topic. Oh goodness, video. yes. <laughs> Rina, what's your question? Uh, well, actually, so Critica already kind of talked about it, but it was international students working in the U.S. Uh, sometimes the difficulties I find uh, guiding international students is that they're basically kicked out of the country as soon as they graduate. <laughs> So uh, with the visa issues, so is it the university that can help 
uh, sponsor the student or is it the job or how does it work? So Rana, I can talk, uh, you know, very briefly. I'm not an immigration specialist. Yeah, so I, yeah. I, you know, I want you to take this just anecdotally because I've lived yeah. the life and as a career advisor, obviously you learn little things along the way. Mm -hmm. So every student in the United States gets something called CPT and OPT, right? So CPT stands for Curricular Practical Training, which is not a visa status. It is just a privilege within the F-1 visa, which is your student visa. CPT allows a student to get an internship opportunity or some kind of like practical experience while they're currently students. So before they graduate. And then this OPT period, which is called op uh, optional practical training, allows a student, irrespective of their uh, field of education, their academic background, to get one year of work experience in the field of their studies post-graduation. So they get that one year. Now there are students who get even more than that. If they happen to be from a STEM field, science, tech, engineering, or math, mathematics, they can apply for a 24 month extension. So they can technically get three years post completion of their graduate program or undergraduate program to work legally in the United States. And at this time, an employer doesn't have to sponsor them at all. So if they get a student who first of all, maybe does an internship with them on CPT, and then because they've got to know the student, they hire them full time and it's a STEM student, maybe in IT or you know, in analytics or whatever. And then the student can work with them for three years that's three years that an employer would hire them in, in the exact same way that they would hire any domestic candidate. They have to do nothing extra. Okay. However, if they wanna retain the student after the three years, then they have to apply for a visa. But here's the good news. Three years is a long, long time for a student to prove their worth, that they are worth that visa. That why bring a new person on the team and train them from scratch when you can just pay a tiny bit of money and keep a seasoned professional on your staff who brings so much, you know, in terms of skills and academic background, as well as cultural background to the table. So the good news is that in spite of the pandemic, despite even some unfavorable like government situations who've not been very friendly towards immigrants in the past, the number of H-1B visa applications has actually grown every single year, um, despite all of these challenges. So it's, it's actually been very promising. Okay. So I know it sounds like students get kicked out, but actually there's a little bit of a buffer, but students have to be so intentional so that they're not waiting until they finish graduation to start looking for that job because then they're running out of time. They wanna start long before so that by the time they get to that point where they're receiving their degree and they're graduating, they've got a job lined up. Okay. And that's where we help. That's where, yes, you mentioned does a university support. That's where someone like me, in career exploration and development, I'll work with them through their four years of undergrad and grad school to make sure they're the most competitive candidates when they graduate. Nice. All right, thank you. You're most welcome. What are other questions you might have for me or for color? What's on your minds? Good question though. Yeah. All right. Well, sorry, go ahead. No, I think that's all we have. I don't think the, that was a really good session. Thank you, Kritika, for the introduction. Or again, our communication is, uh, contact information is on the screen right now. So if you would like to take it, uh, feel free to reach out to us. I'm going to send a quick email after the session. And uh, thank you again for everybody to uh, 